All right, so I have communion this morning. We're going to be looking at John chapter 11. <clears throat> okay, so you guys know in John chapter 11, it's the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And uh, there was a town of Bethany, and there was three siblings, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Lazarus, sick. And so Jesus didn't get up and immediately come. He waited a couple of more days. But we can look at the sisters sending for Jesus as a prayer. Because the difference between now and then is Jesus was physically on earth. So they could send for him, right, through messengers. Well, our messenger, per se, I guess today would be prayer, right, where we can call out to him. Anyway... The girls had an immediate problem. Their brother was sick. And they wanted Jesus to attend to it. But God is always about his glory. And he doesn't confuse the immediate with the important. See, immediately they needed Lazarus tended to. But what was important was the glory of God. And so Jesus said, uh, this sickness isn't to death before the glory of God, that the Son may be glorified through it. Now, the thing that's important in every situation is the Lord's glory. But as humans, we get the Lord's glory and our immediate issues confused. Mm. It's like, Lord, if you tend to my immediate issue, you'll get glory. <laughs> right? That's because our emotions are concerned about me and the right now. Make something happen so I get comfort. But the Lord is always about his glory. And so he waited. And then when he finally did go, Lazarus had been dead for four days. And his sister Martha came to Jesus. And when she saw him, she said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have, wouldn't have died. Now, I don't know how many times I've heard it countlessly taught that she was giving him attitude. Like, if you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died, right? <laughs> but that wasn't what she was saying. She was struggling between the conflict of what's immediate and what's important. And her next statement was, but even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. See, what she was saying was this, Lord, if you'd have been here, he could have lived. But I know everything that you do is good, right, and has a purpose. I don't understand, but I know that whatever you do is right. And that's that conflict we have between the immediate and the important, right? She wasn't giving an attitude. She was just saying, I don't understand, but I know what you're doing is right, right? You didn't come immediately, and I don't know why you allowed my brother whom you love to die. But whatever you do, I know God will give you what you ask for. And then Mary... The other sister, she came and said the same thing to Jesus. And Jesus said, where have you laid him? Now, in the old King James, one of the sisters say, well, he's been dead for four days, so surely now he stinketh. <laughs> right? Like, he stank. Don't open the tomb. But Jesus said, take away the stone. Now, that stone on our side of heaven means death is final. But Jesus said, move the stone out the way because death isn't final. Hallelujah. And then he said, Lazarus, come forth. Now, I don't know how many times I've heard this taught times over and over again. Jesus had to say Lazarus because if he'd have just said, come forth, all the graves would have opened. Okay. <laughs> The big problem with that is that means God has no power, no 
control over his power. It's just like if he speaks, it's just chaos. No, he said Lazarus because he knows his sheep by name. He could have said come forth, and only the one he wanted to come forth would have came forth, but he knows his sheep by name. So he called them by name. But when Mary and Martha came to him, he told them, listen, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Because he's the resurrection. He's the life. And on the night that he was crucified, he had took the bread. You guys want to get your bread? You might need a combination to break into this. <laughs> but he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Because you're a sinner, I gave my life on the cross. And for us, oh, mamas, for us, <laughs> in John 1, 7, it says, if we walk in the light. We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so his body, broken body, heals us from what we are, and that is a sinner. So take and eat. But after that, he took the cup and he said, this cup represents my blood that is shed for you. And the blood is life. He told Mary, I am the resurrection and the life. And Philippians 3.10 says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. In other words, if we die with him, we know that we will rise with him. So he said, take my blood and drink. And it will cleanse you from everything you do every day as you think about things, look at things, say things. The stuff you know you're not supposed to do, right? When they say it's under the blood, that's what they mean. Oops, under the blood. Didn't mean to punch you in your eye. So take and drink. Lord, we thank you so much that you are the resurrection, that you are the life and the light of men. We thank you that you have called us to pick up her cross, follow you, join in the fellowship of your sufferings. You didn't call us to happy, rich, and wealthy, but to walk the walk of Christ. And so we praise you, we glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.